Hi there, everyone. It's Christy. I'm back from my conference, which was good and intense and productive. And it's, um, you know, I've been doing YouTube now for two years, and it's it's just strange to me to not make a video for an entire week. And so even though it's the Easter weekend and I have several hangouts coming up, one with the Wooly Bumblebee, another with Professor F Philip Moriarty, which I'm very excited about. I'm going to be doing a hangout with him coming up in the next few days that will be here, that will appear here on this channel. Uh, but it's not enough. I feel like that I need to, I wanted to bring attention this week in particular to a series of news articles that was inspired in some ways by a shit tweeter to me. Someone sent me a DM going, uh, feminism is no longer needed in the West. All it is is a chance for women to um, get a lot, you know, get an advantage over men. My response was to start replying was was to reply with various articles that demonstrated why feminism was needed in the West. And as the days went by, the person didn't respond, but I found it kind of helpful to have this list of articles because it showed me the patterns that I see, uh, you know, demonstrates in the news issues about uh, women's bodily autonomy, rape culture, sexism, the barriers women face in employment and in ordinary life, the, the bigotry and the misogyny that's out there. So I thought I would do a, a series, just basically a video that highlighted it, show you what I notice in the news for a week. And so obviously this is a spoof title, This Week in Stupid Misogynists. Let's get started. Um, and I'm going to warn you guys, this is not going to be a up and positive and happy episode. Sadly, these are really difficult and tragic issues. But in order to try to make it less completely depressing, I do have a good news story at the end. And also, I want to have a discussion near the end about the article that came out from the South African Huffington Post by a um, an MA student in philosophy on the issue of male suffrage, white male suffrage in particular. So that's what we're going to be looking at, news stories from across the world, mostly the West, to be honest, and um, stories that really focus on the problems and challenges women face that make feminism necessary. If you've been on Twitter recently and you've followed me and followed other people on the YouTube, in the YouTube atheist community on both sides of the, um, the issues, you will probably have seen this hashtag, Save Dina Ali. This is bringing attention to the plight of a Saudi woman who, seeking asylum, was forcibly returned home. And this hashtag and her experiences are raising issues of male guardianship and also the oppression of women in Saudi Arabia. So according to this article on the BBC, Dina Ali Lasum was reportedly en route from Kuwait to Australia via the Philippines but was taken back home in a Manila airport by her family. She used a Canadian tourist phone to send a message in a video that was posted on Twitter saying that her family would kill her. She arrived in Rehad on Tuesday night, and her fate remains unknown at the time that this blog was published. There are real problems, as we all know. Saudi Arabia is one of the worst countries for respecting women's dignity and women's rights and autonomy. The problem, of course, is trying to get the Saudi Arabian government to... Um, you have pressure points that will make them act in a more humane and humani humanitarian and humanist fashion. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a link to the Save Dina Ali online petition at change.org. Hopefully other groups bringing attention to this will force the Saudi government to not allow her to be harmed by her family because of the international embarrassment. The more pressure that can be put on the Saudi government to elevate women's rights in their countries is a good thing. So if you can go ahead and, and sign that petition, or if you know other ways of putting pressure on the Saudi government, please leave it in the comment section below and other people here will see it and share it. Of course, Muslim women are not only oppressed by their own governments. Many women are oppressed in the West where they're meant to have liberty and freedom. And this story, I'm sad to say, comes from my home state of Wisconsin, where a man approached a Muslim woman tried to tear off her hijab, and when he couldn't, he decided to beat and then stab her. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that if you're upset with the oppression of women under Islam, the people to take it out on are not the women who are oppressed. 
I know that it's easy to see a, a woman and know that she's Muslim because she is forced to physically display the conformity to her religious beliefs for the whole world to see in a way that men who are Muslims are not. But when you get angry at seeing the hijab as a symbol of oppression, your reaction should be empathy. Because it might be the case that woman doesn't want to go outside dressed that way, but her fathers and her brothers and her cousins won't let her do anything except that. And how does it solve the problem of her oppression by a patriarchal misogynistic religion? And how does it solve the problem to treat her with the same contempt and misogynistic attitudes that her religion forces upon her? Or even worse, with violence, how do you end the oppression of people by attacking the oppressed? It makes no sense. And I think we all need to step up and speak out against targeting of Muslim women because they are easy targets because they have to wear their religious conformity. In the newspaper article, the victim told the local news station, I said to myself, I'm going to die today for sure. So he gets up from the car and told me to come here. He said to take my hijab, my scarf. I tried to fight him. Don't take my hijab, you know? So he threw me on the floor. Then he beat me like an animal. One of the spokespeople for the Muslim society said that because nothing was stolen and there was no robbery, the only motive they can think of, because everything stayed with her, that this individual went straight for her scarf. Therefore, it's a hate crime. According to this article in The Independent, the number of hate groups specifically targeting Muslims nearly tripled in the U.S. across 2016. And figures from major cities suggest that Islamophobic hate crimes have been on the rise since Donald Trump was elected. You're not going to make your case that the United States is a moral secular country by attacking Muslim women who have to conform their clothing to a misogynistic patriarchal religion. I hope we're all clear on that point now. Our next story deals with an Ethiopian man who was convicted in Georgia of mutilating his two-year-old daughter's genitals. He has been sent back to his home country by the United States Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency. The man served 10 years in prison, and it's thought that this was the first criminal conviction in the United States for female genital mutilation. I do think, personally, my opinion is that um, if people come to the United States and other countries where these practices are legal, and I think they should be illegal in all countries, there should not be exceptions made for customs. Now, I also feel the same way about the circumcision of boys. I think that genital mutilation of children is wrong in every case, in every single case. And I think that if you want to have these kinds of rituals, you can wait till the child is old enough to consent to participate. That's my stance, always has been. I hope it always will be. I believe in bodily autonomy and see no reason why parents should be able to cut parts off of their children just because they donated their genetic materials to that person's body. That body does not belong to them. It belongs to their children. And the awareness of female genital mutilation being illegal, having resources and, and other things in a community where if these practices are going on in secret, that school officials can report it, other members of the community can report it, and children can be made safe, that's an active practice that we need to be doing. Keeping children safe from these kinds of lifetime mutilations of their bodies is something that we have to pay attention to, and that's something that I know as a feminist, I'm definitely committed to. The next case is also about female genital mutilation. This is a woman who's been avoiding having herself cut since she was young, has fled to Australia for asylum protection, and has been turned away. A woman who escaped from Ghana to avoid female genital mutilation has been ordered to leave Australia in just over two weeks after her application for a protection visa was rejected. Patricia Osse, who has a four-year-old daughter and an Australian de facto husband, fears she will be kidnapped when she returns to Ghana and forced to undergo the potentially deadly procedure. She has implored the Australian Federal Immigration Minister, Peter Dutton, to intervene on compassionate grounds after a tribunal recently rejected her application. She became scared of the tradition as a child when an older woman bled to death. From the age of nine until six years ago when she arrived in Perth, aged 30, she would run away every July, the month when women are made to have their genitalia mutilated. She would sleep on the streets and scavenge for food in cities and other villages. She said she was sometimes chased by up to three men who wanted to kidnap her and force her to undergo the procedure. 
Miss Osei is literally and metaphorically a marked woman with a scar on her cheek inflicted on all women from her tribe, making her making it easy for her tribesmen through the bush telegraph to track her down in other villages and cities. Quote, I have always been running and running and running. I could not stop running until I got to Australia, she said from her St. James unit. I would rather die than go through that pain. Our next story also deals with female genital mutilation, this time in the United Kingdom. And this story talks about how female genital mutilation is affecting the West Midlands, where the Birmingham Mail writes, Sandwell and West Birmingham, CCG, saw the highest number of female genital mutilation cases. From the article, Doctors in West Midlands are identifying 20 new cases of female genital mutilation every week. Between October and December 2016, those are the latest figures available, the total number of female genital mutilation attendances rose to 255 compared to 220 in the same period in 2015. Locally, Sandwell and West Birmingham CCG saw the highest number of FGM cases with 80 new women recorded. That compares with 73 in the same period in 2015. Across the whole of England, 2,332 attendances for female genital mutilation were recorded during the last quarter of 2016. These attendances included 1,268 women or girls whose cases were newly recorded. I know that there are many people who want feminists in the West to only focus on women in the Middle East, but the fact is that these are neighborhood issues. These are cases of of oppressive, patriarchal, misogynistic practices that are happening, if you're in the UK, maybe right next door. So this isn't, feminism is needed in the West. And feminists and people who support women's bodily autonomy, we need to be aware of these cases, outraged by them, and working on changing the cultural practices in these communities to prevent girls from being mutilated like this. We have it within our ability to bring attention to this and to protect these girls. And the question is, what are we doing? And I'm going to tell you, making a YouTube video isn't enough. I'm sitting here making this video myself thinking, I'm not doing enough. I don't even live in the UK and I don't feel like I'm doing enough. So uh, again, the idea that we don't need feminism in the West is just refuted by looking through and paying attention to the stories in your own newspapers. Another reason that we need feminism in the West is to bring awareness to, pay attention to, and speak out against institutional uh, practices that protect sexual predators or leave people vulnerable to sexual attacks. Whatever you think about the civil law breaking that is violating your um, visa stay, it's not a criminal act when you are an undocumented worker. It is a civil crime. I don't think any of us would say that because you are in a country illegally, you deserve to be sexually assaulted, or that if you are in a country illegally, if you are sexually assaulted, you should have no recourse or no protection from that. And yet we have concerns about, there are concerns about how people are being treated in, uh, in U.S. custody. An advocacy group said Tuesday that the U.S. Department of Homeland Security's internal watchdog fielded more than 1,000 complaints of sexual assault or sexual abuse from people in U.S. custody in a little more than two years. Community Initiatives for Visiting Immigrants in Confinement is the latest group in recent years to document allegations of abuse at immigration detention centers based on information obtained from public record requests. The number obtained by the group doesn't provide details on individual cases, including how many alleged perpetrators were de other detainees or staff, and it doesn't provide a full accounting of how the complaints were addressed. Still, they suggest complaints are common. This is something, again, that we should be concerned about. Because you're an undocumented immigrant, you don't lose your human rights. You don't lose the right to be safe from sexual abuse or sexual harassment. And paying attention to these concerns, whether it's detainee on detainee issues, that has, that has to be something we look at to make sure people are safe when they are in these holding places and detention centers. If it's staff on detainee, then that has to be taken very, very seriously, just as we would in prison if prison guards were sexually abusing prisoners. This, this, being detained does not deny you your humanity. And again, this is something that I think feminists in particular 
pay attention to because of the vulnerability of women to these complaints. They're disproportionately made by women, and these are disproportionately women's concerns. But obviously, any sexual assault, any sexual abuse, whatever the sex or genders of the perpetrators and the victims, these are wrong. They need to be identified and dealt with in a rigorous manner that makes sure people are protected and safe. So again, another issue of that I think is something that is a feminist issue, um, protecting people from sexual assault. Disproportionately women, but it covers everybody. Staying in the U.S., this next story covers the San Bernardino shooting that was initially considered um, a sort of worried it was an act of terror. As news came out, it was revealed that it was really an issue of domestic violence. As they write here in the Huffington Post, the story police told was as American as apple pie, a rage-filled man taking his wife's life. On Monday, Karen Smith was doing what she loved, teaching students with intellectual disabilities, when her estranged husband walked into her classroom armed with a three fifty seven handgun, police said. He just shot everywhere before reloading and killing himself. A child who witnessed the scene told the Los Angeles Times, Smith died. Two of her students were also hit by errant bullets. One eight-year-old, Jonathan Martinez, died later that day. The eight-year-old and his teacher were dead, but the public breathed a sigh of relief. At least the shooting was not an act of terrorism. That reaction, or lack of one, is misguided. The latest San Bernardino shooting was also an act of terror, a much more common kind, with a much higher death toll, the kind women face when trapped in abusive relationships. According to PolitiFact, there have been 71 deaths due to extremist attacks on U.S. soil from 2005 until 2015. Compare that to the drumbeat of women killed by their intimate partners, which number three daily. In California alone, there were 118 domestic violence-related homicides in 2015. On average, there are nearly 11 murder-suicides nationally each week. Most involve a man killing his wife or girlfriend using a gun. But they get little sustained media attention. Smith was planning to divorce Anderson after a brief marriage, her mother told the Los Angeles Times. Women are in the most danger when they are trying to leave relationships, experts say. And black women have historically disproportionately experienced high rates of fatal domestic violence. In 2013, black women were murdered at a rate two and a half times that of white women, according to a study that examined incidents in which men killed women. This is why we need feminism. Because even though terrorist attacks are far less common, we are less impacted by a man killing a woman because it's so routine. It shouldn't be routine. We should be as outraged at the systematic killing of innocent people in a terrorist attack as we are people who are innocent being killed by their estranged partners because their partners can't handle them breaking up. That's far more likely to happen to you or someone you know or someone you love than being um, in a terrorist attack. When there are discussions of rape culture, as we're going to be discussing here, I think, in this, this next story, a lot of times people conflate rape with rape culture. And while rape obviously is a part of rape culture, what rape culture d refers to, at least in, in this instance, I'm going to be talking about it, is institutional practices or people who hold power in an institution who try to cover up sexual assault, who try to protect certain people that they want to protect and silence victims and marginalize victims. An example of this is the Catholic Church with the priest pedophilia scandal. That is an example of a rape culture because men who sexually assaulted children, who raped children, were protected and they were allowed to go on and continue to commit more sexual assaults against more children. You can see it with the, the Jerry um, Sandusky sexual uh, assault case where the university tried to protect him and as a consequence of their trying to protect him and ignoring the consequences and the severity of his sexual assaults, he was allowed to victimize more people. This case is also dealing with that kind of institutional cover-up of sexual assault, trying to minimize the crime of sexual assault, which of course then emboldens and encourages or at least allows sexual predators to go on and potentially victimize more, more victims, if that's slightly not slightly redundant. 
This case, though, it's not a traditional sexual assault scandal, as we would think of, where we're talking about boys sexually assaulting girls. Here we're talking about sexual assaults that are being covered up as part of hazing rituals. From the article, an explosive high school sexual assault scandal rocking the small town of Lavernia, Texas, widened Tuesday with the arrest of three additional students and the filing of a federal lawsuit alleging school officials knew about the criminal hazings going on in the athletic program and failed to protect student victims. Again, that's why I'm calling it a rape culture story. Three members of the school's basketball team were released from Wilson County Jail after they were booked on sexual assault charges on Tuesday. According to the arrest affidavits, the three high school athletes overpowered and held down a struggling 15-year-old, while one of them inserted a flashlight into his rectum. The victim did not report the alleged assault to his parents, but later described the attack in a videotaped interview at the Children's Alliance of South Texas. Dozens of alleged victims have come forward to authorities in the last month with claims of sexual assault, including sodomy as part of hazing rituals practiced by Lavernia High School varsity athletes. A total of 13 students, six of them adults, have now been arrested and charged with sexual assault. But the case goes just beyond the students, according to a new lawsuit filed in Texas. School coaches allegedly sanctioned these rituals, while other school officials turned a blind eye toward the abuse even after the abuse was reported to them, according to the 19-page complaint. This article is quite lengthy and worth your time to learn the details of this case. I will go ahead, of course, and put a link in the description box below. And I just want to point out again before moving on, when people deny rape culture exists, when people deny rape culture is a thing that happens in the West, they're denying that what is happening at this institution is is wrong or a problem. This is what a rape culture is. It's, It's a culture, an institutional practice in this case, that excuses and overlooks the sexual crimes of certain individuals that are have a high status and that allows them of course to continue to engage in sexually abusing other people it allows the purpose it allows the predators to continue to victimize people and until we recognize the way that systems protect rapists and we look at the institutional incentives to protect sexual people who commit sexual assault or rape, and we undo those perverse incentives to stay quiet, to p- push it all under the rug, then we're going to not be dealing with the problem at the institutional level. And that's what I think the point of discussing rape culture is, is to look beyond the individual criminals who are or the, the people accused of committing these crimes and look at the way that institutions either minimize the problem, thereby allowing it to continue, or actively cover it up. Another story out of the United States, we have seen nonstop the way that Republicans go after Planned Parenthood and women's health. This is another step in that. We've seen Donald Trump going after, well, he's gagged medical officials around the world, or at least tried to gag them in order to prevent them from even discussing abortion as an option with patients in other countries. And now he has signed a resolution that will allow states to withhold Title X family planning funds from Planned Parenthood or other abortion providers. Rather than caring about women's health, what they want to do is use the power of the state to control women's bodies. And if you're a libertarian and if you believe in bodily autonomy, as I do, if you think that people ultimately have the ability to decide whether or not, you know, they want a vasectomy, they want to have an abortion, obviously there are issues here with conflict of interest, when the state should intervene, if the fetus is viable enough to live independently, then of course I think the state has a vested interest. But if we're talking about, um, you know, abortion within the first trimester, or the first four months, then why should the state force women to have babies that those women don't either can't afford to have, or they're not ready to have, or they're just not, you know, they don't want to be parents? Why is it the, the business of the state to deny women the ability to control their own fertility, either through accessing contraception, which is also something that these people are going after, or for whatever reason, contraception fail, whatever reason they need, Uh, abortion services, why should the state deny women that health care access? Again, this is why we need feminism in the West. I'm a 16-year-old from Tucson. I just want to say some facts. Um, 
Um, so I'm a young woman, and you're a middle-aged man. I'm a person of color, and you're white. Um, I come from a background of poverty, and I didn't always have parents to guide me through life. You come from privilege. So I'm wondering, as a Planned Parenthood patient and someone who relies on Title X, who you are clearly not, why it's your right to take away my right? We spoke earlier about the asshole who went ahead and beat up a woman because she was wearing a hijab, presumably because he was offended by her wearing the hijab and therefore wanted to use violence against her. Speculation on my part, but I wouldn't be surprised if that was the reason. And the other thing that I want to bring out here about, um, and it is a feminist response, we have a story here about a man in Texas who followed a woman into the bathroom to check her gender because he thought that she was dressed like a man. Can you imagine that? You know, you have someone coming along who it's none of their freaking business who you are or what you're doing, and yet they feel like they have to police you. Strangers policing your behavior, whether it's wearing a hijab or making sure you're a woman when you go into the bathroom in the way that they want to define what it means to be a woman, this just smacks a lot of the sort of virtue police that they have in theocracies, where you have thugs walking around making sure people conform and stay in line. And these self-appointed moral police are more dangerous than the trans people who need to use, who need to use the bathroom and want to use the bathroom that they identify the gender they identify with. I'm far more worried about about people who are going to be um, taking it upon themselves to police other people's behavior, like wearing a hijab or being woman enough in their opinion to use a woman's bathroom, than I am about the woman wearing the hijab or a trans person going to use the, the wash their hands in the facilities that are available. And we have to st speak out and we have to know these things are going on first, right? Educate and then agitate, be outraged and say that this is wrong. And then there's, you know, issues of how do you, what do you do next? And I think part of it is talking about it like I'm doing here. For you, it might be if in a conversation, someone comes up with an opinion about this, you know, talk about the implications, the moral implications of citizens taking it upon themselves to police bathrooms and the kinds of problems that that could create and violence that that could create. And how that's vigilantism, that that's a theocratic imposition of someone's, you know, in some ways, if you're talking about in a place like Texas, where it's highly Christian, this might be motivated in terms of religious conformity to make other people conform to their religious beliefs. These are issues I think we need to be talking about. And feminism provides a moral frame, an ideological set of principles that we can use to critique the sort of heteronormativity. We can talk about transphobia and gender roles, the way that patriarchal gender roles are really challenged by people who don't conform to them, the way that in the previous story, that the myths about male rape victims or male sexual assault victims prevent them from coming forward. These are all things that are definitely within the feminist wheelhouse that we have a theoretical framework for talking about. It's why we need feminism in the West and hopefully to stop things like Texas men following people into the bathroom to gender check them from happening. Now, I have one more story from the United States that I wanted to bring up in terms of this week and stupid misogynists, and that's Bill O'Reilly. Uh, Fox News generally has a sexism problem. It's obviously, it's got a corporate culture of enabling and protecting men who are sexual predators or sex pests. It's a place where men think, where men with power, at least Roger Ailes and Bill, Bill O'Reilly, have the opinion that because they wield power over hiring and firing, that they're able to, without any qualms, leverage that to get themselves sexual pleasure. That's just fucked up. I'm sorry, but a workplace is not a place where you go in order to um, leverage people into having sex with you, to barter your sexual pleasure for someone else's employment promotion. That's disgusting, to be honest. And Bill O'Reilly has obviously got a, has a pattern here of 
of being a sex pest, being uh, someone who uses his power and authority to try to intimidate women into sleeping with him. I I really hope. I mean, this the one of the most disgusting things about this, to be honest, is the extent to which Fox News has been willing to pay women off rather than hold these men accountable. It must be really nice to be Bill O'Reilly and have a different set of rules that you live by, that you can do things that are clearly against the law and hopefully against corporate policy at Fox News. And yet, rather than being held to account, the media outlet pays millions and millions of dollars to protect and enable and further your sexual predations. And that means he can go on and do it again and again. And he has done it again and again. They've already paid out on like five women's complaints. And there's another complaint. And there's another woman that uh, the the latest woman, I th- Marsh, I think her name is, uh, spoke to who was afraid to come forward. You know, so this is what we mean when we talk about rape culture. These cultures that protect predators and allow them to continue to look for victims. That's a huge problem. So let's talk about the way that some people have uh, overreacted, in my opinion, to this little blog piece coming out of South Africa. Now, in sum, uh, this uh, basically, it's a, it's a master's student in philosophy. She wrote a piece that talks about the redistribution of wealth being long overdue and the way that wealth and power are disproportionately in the hands of white males. Her thought experiment remedy to this is to put a moratorium on the votes of white males for 30 or 40 years to give the chance for these uh, redistribution, uh, redistribution of power and status. Let me go on the record. I do not agree with this article. Many people, even when I've told them, well, no, one person in particular, when I told them I disagreed with this article, accused me of agreeing with it, um, even though I stated that I disagreed with it. So I know there are a lot of people who want to put words in my mouth on this issue that somehow I would support this. Not the case. I don't support denying anyone the vote. What I want to talk about today is the bad tendency of people to generalize the opinion of one person, in this case, this one MA philosophy student in South Africa, to progressives. I've watched the kerfuffle on social media about this article. I cannot find a single person who would be called a progressive who agrees with this. And yet people talk about a progressive stance on denying white men the vote. No, this is Shelley Garland's view. She's one person, she's an MA student, and she's publishing in a South African edition of the Huffington Post. Now, I don't go around a- applying the views of Milo Yiannopoulos on having sex with, and um, priests having sex with teenage boys to every single conservative. I criticize Milo and his defenders on that issue. If people are going to defend Milo on saying that kind of BS, then yeah, I will criticize you. And I'll criticize Milo for what he says. But I'm not going to label everyone on the conservative side of the movement with Milo's views. And I want to see people stop doing the same with progressives. If you want to talk about Shelley Garland's opinion about denying white men the franchise or putting a moratorium on it, knock yourself out. Speak to her. Say her name. But don't say that these are progressive views. Don't say that progressives are arguing for this. It's bullshit. And you need to be more accurate in your comments. And if you want to take on her points, take on her points. But take on her points. Don't apply them to me or any of my friends or anyone else who has not articulated them. Stop it. It's very naughty. And once again, just to be clear, don't agree with the piece. Okay, guys, so I know this has been a rough... Uh, episode has been pretty depressing. We've got Saudi Arabia, anti-women policies, female genital mutilation, rape culture. But I wanted to at least present one positive, one bright spot, one small step forward for feminism and uh, for women in the West in terms of gaining equality. This story comes from a source I wouldn't usually use, the Mail Online, but they are the ones that I saw covering it. So I'm going to go ahead and Give them the the coverage, the the exposure. From the UK Daily Mail. An Arizona high school kicker, 18, becomes the first female player to receive an NCAA football scholarship. Becca Longo, a kicker from Chandler Basha High School's football team, signed her letter of intent to play college football with Division II Adams State University in Colorado last month. 
However, she was quite surprised when her football coach said that she was the first woman ever to re receive a scholarship at the Division II level or higher, according to ESPN. Longo told the sports news site she had no idea she was the first woman to receive this distinction and that she's still in shock from it. Longo told ESPN that she has had a fascination with kicking for years despite suffering a back injury that led doctors to believe she would never play sports again. Last year, she won a starting job on field goals and extra points. I think the, what really gives me hope about this story is that it's about meritocracy. It's not that she was offered a scholarship because she was a woman. She was offered the scholarship because she had talent. And you know, the way that she was discovered to have talent, she was given the opportunity. That sexism and patriarchal attitudes didn't judge her before she had a chance to get on the field and develop her school skills and compete at the level of every other player on that field. And I think ultimately this is what fe about feminism gives me hope in terms of moving forward, is that the more that we can tear down the sexist assumptions and the barriers to women's participations in, non in traditionally non-female spaces, that we can find really talented people who have more of an opportunity in the 21st century than in any other time in human history to really develop their talents. And if we allow people who have talent to develop that talent without barriers because of their sex or their ethnicity or their disability, then we all benefit. Meritocracy is good for everybody. And ultimately, as an American and as a feminist, true meritocracy, the true rising to the top of people who have talent and are willing to work hard for it, that's really the kind of society I want to see. It's a society where talented people flourish to their and our benefit. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this one-off, perhaps, episode of This Week in Stupid Misogynist. It's been good for me to kind of show you the stuff that I see in the news, the stuff that I that pops up on my Twitter feed and then I click the link and I want to know more about because all of these to me are examples of why we need feminism in the West and in the East and the North and the South and all over the world. If you want to follow along with these kinds of stories, I do put a lot of them on my Facebook page for my YouTube website. You can go and find that by scrolling in the description box near the bottom. You can join or like that page and then you won't have to um, I'll put these stories up. You don't have to look for them yourselves. You can just follow my feed on Facebook. I also, of course, tweet a lot of these things on Twitter. You can uh, stay in touch with me there. So, well, I've gotten a lot of videoing out of my system now. This has been a rather long one, and I feel much better for it. So, until my upcoming various hangouts, I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Please do read the articles in the description box below. And I will talk to you again very soon. Bye-bye.